<laughs> and so, I, um, as Mark says, I created a website called Skeptical Medicine. It's mainly geared towards uh, doctors and medical students, but also anyone interested in skepticism and uh, skeptical science. I, I titled this talk, uh, Why People Believe Weird Things in Medicine. And as Mark alluded to, uh, this, this was, I, I think, our, our medical school class, you know, back in the day, uh, where we were just taught, wrote the facts, we read the books, we crammed for tests, we stood around bedside and, and uh, quoted all of this knowledge back to the attending professor. And again, in class, we were just taught the basic facts. Well, in medicine, it wasn't E equals MC squared. It was more of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation as the basic. And so I thought I knew a lot about medicine, and I was ready to share my information with my patients. And as soon as I got into the clinics, they started asking me about these things. They want to know what herbs I should take. They want to know why if they should have needles placed under their skin. They wanted to know if they should have their chakras uh, uh, manipulated or their, their uh, flow of energy manipulated in their next. I didn't know what they were talking about, but I just kind of shrugged it off. Until about 1998. You guys know who this is? Andrew Wakefield. Andrew Wakefield is a British pediatric <clears throat> gastroenterologist. And he was, um, well, let's say, not very ethical in his research. There was a lot of uh, buzz about uh, a presumed rise in the rates of autism around that time. He apparently was given 12 patients to study. It turns out he was given these 12 patients by um, attorneys looking to sue vaccine manufacturers. And he had a, a team of researchers with him, and they did some these case studies. He did uh, colonoscopies on these 12 children with autism, and he claimed to find measles in all of their colons. I believe, I believe it was all. Well, the problem was uh, this was not true. This was fraudulent. The initial tests were negative. He sent them out to a special lab that he did business with, who then found it to be positive. But nonetheless, the, this was published in The Lancet. It was a very mundane article, and it didn't even say anything about autism, certainly in the title or most of the body. But he went on the news the day before it was published. And before you knew it, the world was looking at headlines like this. Measles jab, new link to brain damage. And then are the true the truth behind the crisis. And it doesn't take long for a genie to get out of the bottle. Now, before you knew it, this was debunked in the medical literature. And I started to breathe easy because it, the, the paper was retracted from the Lancet. It's not there anywhere. If you look through the medical literature, it is not there anywhere. It was found to be fraudulent. And by the way, Andrew Wakefield lost his license to practice medicine. He's no longer in England. He's still in Texas, though. <laughs> <laughs> Making far more money than any of us are giving talks like this to different groups. So the headlines started to change, you know, and reporting that these this paper was fraudulent. But it didn't stop the public from believing it. You know, you know her? Jimmy McCarthy. Jimmy McCarthy. <laughs> and she was very, very public about this notion that vaccines cause autism. And it was starting to leak over into my practice. I was starting to get very concerned about this because I was giving people the right information, but yet they weren't believing it. And it wasn't just celebrities. And who Wakefield had powerful friends. Healthy young child goes to a doctor, gets pumped with massive shots of many vaccines, doesn't feel good and changes. Boom, autism, any such cases. Now, I don't want to get too political, I really don't. In fact, it's uh, vaccine denialism is not unique to one political spectrum. There's Marion Williamson just recently. When I was a child, we took far fewer vaccines, and there was far much less bungling, and there was much less chronic illness. Now, what was going on here? I, I, I was really upset, and I was, I, I, most of, many of my colleagues were kind of upset too, but they just, most of them look like this. <laughs> and in skeptical circles, we learned to call this shreddies. 
Many of my colleagues were shruggies, and across the world, many of them were shruggies. So what was going on? I didn't know how to communicate what I knew was the, the, the right information. Then I came across this book while on vacation, uh, visiting my sister-in-law. It was on the bookshelf. I started reading it, and I realized that there was a whole community of, of people and academics who were trained in critical thinking, and I really hadn't learned anything about critical thinking, not through my degree in chemistry, not through my degree in medical school. I mean, there was a little bit, but, but not really uh, what was out there. I didn't know why people believed in these things. I didn't even know how to identify what was a weird thing. You know, it's kind of like that old saying, you know it when you see it, right? So anyway, it was written by Michael Sherman, I got to meet him. And so I want to divide this talk into a couple of sections. You know, one is I want to find out what makes a claim weird. I also want to know why do people believe weird things? And then I want to give some examples of weird things in medicine. There's many weird things outside of medicine. So we'll stick to that for now. So I started reading and started reading. Many of you may recognize some of these books. Uh, and certainly Carl Sagan's classic, The Being Hot in the World, led me to many other books here. Uh, and I started learning on my own the, the tenets of critical thinking, <coughs> skepticism. And I came across a book uh, by James Randi. It was also referenced in some of these other books. You guys know James Randi? Mm -hmm. Most of the people who do. But as a child and a teenager and beyond, I, I, I was uh, I considered myself to be a magician. I used to give shows to crowds like this and birthday parties and all kinds of stuff. James Randi was a hero of mine growing up, and then, and then I came to find that he had a, a, a bigger, a, a second career after magic. He, his concern was that he recognized that there were charlatans out there using his craft, using magic tricks to convince people of weird things, to convince people that they were doing things that they weren't actually doing, mainly Yuri Geller back in the 70s. Uh, and so he began this quest of trying to expose the charlatans that were using his craft uh, to, to uh, fool the public. And he created this conference and a whole community of skeptical thinkers. And so I went to him. <coughs> Here's me and Jim Ray. And a couple years later, I brought my daughter Sarah, you see back there. A couple years later, uh, or actually the very next year, my son Justin and I went to the Nexus Conference, which is very similar to the Amazing Meeting. Uh, and that's the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe right there. I don't know if any of you guys listen to that. <coughs> someone over here. At the Amazing Meeting, there was a whole section on science-based medicine. I didn't know what that was, really. Wasn't, wasn't it all science-based? Anyway, it was filled with doctors and academics who were not shrugs, anything but shrugs. You may recognize some of these guys. We'll get back to some of them in, in, in a few minutes. During one of the talks, uh, Wally Sampson, the physician, was giving, he flashed this up there. Now, you, you've heard of flashbulb moments, <laughs> like everyone remembers you know, where they were when the president was shot or when the shuttle blew up. Well, this was a flashbulb moment. Now, it doesn't look like much, but it was very important. Anyway, this is Thomas Bayes from the 18th century. He was a, uh, a statistician, and of course, he defined uh, Bayes' statistics. Anyway, this formula, never mind it right now, but we can, we can rearrange it and make it a little easier to uh, figure out. Now, if you want to think about the probability of any claim, how do you wait? How do you determine if that claim is true? Well, there's two basic things. One is the prior probability of the claim being true. What do we know from all of our knowledge thus far? And what would have to not be true in order for this claim to be true? Is it coherent with the laws of physics? Is it coherent with everything we've known thus far? If not, there may be a problem. So that's prior probability. That's very important. And then you multiply that by the strength of the new evidence. Evidence has a tiering system from weak to strong, we'll put it. 
And we can try and figure out the probability of a claim being true based on these two things. I mean, they're multiplied together. Now, if you have a claim that has a very low probability of being true, let's say, uh, well, we watched the homeopathy video. Let's say the claim that water has memory. Well, based on everything we know about water, chemistry, physics, and prior studies, it's a pretty low probability. <laughs> so it, it's going to take a heck of a lot of evidence to turn the tide and convince a critical thinker that it's true. So this is called Bayesian thinking. Now, that, that big equation that I put up there has a modern translation that I'm sure many of you would probably recognize. You guys know this guy? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's very, very simple. So it, it struck me that weird things are just extraordinary claims without extraordinary evidence. They don't have much prior plausibility, and they don't have strength of new evidence. Even if the evidence is very strong, if the prior plausibility is zero, you multiply anything by zero, it's still zero, something's wrong. So that's the first little tool that I learned about critical thinking. I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring three more to you. First, we want to uh, talk about this. This is Mrs. C. Okay, this is a little uh, audience participation. Mrs. C is friendly but quiet. She keeps to herself. She is very smart, has a college degree, and works with books. She is fond of children but prefers quiet. She works in a school, and she's not a teacher. Okay, you guys have Mrs. C in your head? Yeah. Okay, here's the question. Which is more likely? Mrs. C is a Catholic? Or Mrs. C is a Catholic and a school librarian? Raise your hand for, for A. Raise your hand for B. Both? Okay, good. That's what most people would say. But let's think about it for a second. How many assumptions are in their hypothesis? There's two assumptions we can think of here. Less is better than more. Assumption number one, she's a librarian. I think we could probably be generous and say it's about 90%, maybe even higher. That's even being less than that. We can be very uh, conservative and say, well, maybe about 50%, she's okay. Maybe, depending on her, where, where she works, where she works. We multiply those two together, the hypothesis that she's a Catholic and a librarian is only 45%. 90%? That's 50%, 85%. So it's always going to be less when you have more than one assumption in your picture. So what, what am I describing? This was also described way back in the 1300s, a Franciscan monk. This is uh, William of Ockham. And he said, uh, he, he, coined, uh, he didn't coin the term, we gave it to him later, Ockham's razor. Uh, no more things should be presumed to exist than are absolutely necessary. In other words, the fewer assumptions in an explanation of a phenomenon depends on the better the explanation. So we call this the law of parsimony or just Occam's razor. So that's another rule in our toolbox for skepticism. So we combine that with Bayesian thinking. There's two more, I'm just one real quick here. You guys know this guy? Christopher Richards? Okay. Uh, this is the people have turned this Hitchens uh, razor. Uh, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. But what gives them the right to say? Well, this is a very well known concept. It's called the burden of proof. The burden of proof is on the one making the extraordinary claim. In fact, that's the whole idea of this term consensus. When you hear about this science, it's cons the consensus of scientists all agree that climate change is, is real, or the consensus all agree that vaccines are safe. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about the burden of proof is no longer on the people saying that vaccines are safe. The burden of proof is on those who are saying that they're not. Okay, one more tool in the toolbox here. Uh, as a doctor, I hear this all the time. I see Mark shaking his head there. Okay, it works for me, doctor. Antibiotics cured my cold. That cough medicine really worked. Rabies cured my headache. Acupuncture cured my ear infection. Well, what are we doing here? 
You guys know what this is, right? This is a, a you know, across the street, you push the button and the light turns red. Well, or turns green rather. Does it? Does it really? About 1984, in the city of New York, they, they automated all of their traffic uh, signals, the, the crosswalk signals. And those buttons didn't work anymore. They, they took them up. People were mad. They couldn't control the crosswalk anymore. So they put the buttons back in. They weren't hooked up. <laughs> and even though people knew this, they still liked it better. They had control over the situation where there was no control. They even called these things, this is true, they called them placebo buttons. So which brings me to the, the next topic here. One of the most misunderstood concepts in medicine, the so-called placebo effect. Most people think placebo effect is what? Mind over medicine. You know, I, my, my power of belief is curing my disease. Well, that's not really what we talk about in medicine when we're talking about placebos. What is the placebo effect? There's a series of effects, but they're just basically the sum total of all the perceived effects attributed to any and all things in an experience, <coughs> except for the intervention that you're testing. So it's really a term based on medical, uh, it's a research term. Now, there's lots of placebo effects. The first one we want to go over is natural history of the disease. For instance, common colds. We mentioned the common cold. That, that antibiotic really cured my cold. Well, this was worked out in 1967, the natural progression of a common cold in all its acts. You can see it peaks out around day three, though. Runny nose, congestion, cough. Now, it's, it seems to reason that when things are at their worst, that's when you want to do something. That's when you want to push the button across the street. And if you were to take something right about there, things would start getting better. Symptoms naturally <laughs> decrease. And so I've taken a drug, doesn't even matter what it is, a cough medicine, it could be the, the antibiotic, and I've started getting better. This creates a bit of a bleed. But you didn't get better because you believed it. You got better because of the natural history of the disease. Then there's something called regression to the mean. <coughs> we don't feel good all the time. Most people don't. We have ups and downs. We have good days and bad days. It's reasonable to assume that when you have a bad day, it's probably going to be followed by a regression to the average, regression to the mean, and you feel all right. If you feel really bad here, and you take a drug, or do some type of practice or ritual, and you feel better. Well, this is just the natural uh, regression to the mean for just about every way we feel. So this has to be true. There is a hierarchy in placebos, in, at least in the belief in the effects of placebos anyway. And it seems the more invasive, the more expensive, the better the, the, the procedure seems to work. The perceived effect is, seems to be better. Uh, surgery seems to do better than touching the rituals, which is better than IV injections, which is better than pills. And by the way, the expensive ones seem to work better than the cheap ones. <laughs> Ask anybody when I say, yes, your generic drug is exactly the same as that expensive brand name, oh no. Now, this is a study that was published um, a few years back. I believe it was uh, 2011 in the uh, New England Journal. This is a, I, I'm sorry I put a graph up here. I, I just want to go through it because this is really important to understand what I'm talking about. You can learn a lot from this, this study, this graph. These were the, this was the perceived effects. What they did is they took asthmatics, a whole group of asthmatics. They divided them up into a bunch of different groups, eight groups, I think. Uh, one got, I'm sorry, four groups. One got albuterol, which is the treatment of choice for asthma. It gets you out of trouble. It proves your airway resistance. They gave the next group a placebo inhaler. It didn't have anything in it. The next group got sham acupuncture. That's kind of an oxymoron, but they got sham <laughs> acupuncture. Um, and we're told that that was a treatment for, for asthma. And then the last group didn't get anything at all. They, they weren't told of anything, they, they were just left alone. Now, as you can see, this is the perceived effect. This is not the actual effect, this is the perceived effect. Those who got the actual treatment felt actually the best, but the placebo and the sham acupuncture, in other words, the two placebo treatment groups, they got something, they got paid attention to. They were given a product, they were given 
uh, some type of procedure. And they felt pretty good too, almost as good as the people who took the actual medicine. But no intervention group, did; they, they barely felt good at all. There's a few that uh, reported improvement, but not many. Certainly not as many as the placebo groups, certainly not as many as the actual groups. So that led to a big controversy in, in medicine. Well, are placebos just as good as the treatment? If, the, if people feel good, that's, what's, that's what is important, isn't it? Well, this is what actually happened. This is, well, first of all, that's just the difference then. I, I just wanted to point out that this is the actual placebo effect. A lot of people think it's up here. The actual placebo effect is from not doing anything at all and doing something. The difference between doing something except for the actual treatment. That's the placebo. It's not the difference between doing nothing and the actual treatment. It's the difference between doing nothing and something but not the actual treatment. Now the actual effects of this study, when measured by the lung airflow resistance, the albuterol group did pretty good, and none of the other groups did well at all. So is it better to look good than to feel good? <laughs> These people felt good in the placebo and the sham acupuncture group, that their lung function was not good at all. No, no better than the no intervention group. So it's, if you feel good that you die of respiratory failure, you haven't achieved it. That's important to understand. Anyway, okay, now, placebo effects are not just for drugs. As I said, surgery is one of the most powerful placebo effects. And it's not just about alternative medicine, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, how many, has anyone here had arthroscopic surgery for the knees? A couple people did for arthritis? Uh, well, there was a, a hate, hate to break your bones. There, there, there was a study published back in 1996 that was replicated at least twice later with the same results. But they, it was clever, they wanted to find out does doing arthroscopic surgery on the knee actually do anything beyond all the usual care, the physical therapy, the nursing, the pain medications, what, whatever. And so what they did was they divided people up into two groups. And one group would get an actual knee surgery, the other group would go into the operating room not knowing if they're going to get knee surgery or not. The doctor in the operating room opened up the envelope and found out what group they were in. If they were in the sham group, they got two stars on their leg and sewn back up and wheeled back out of the operating room. And then they got the exact same care because nobody outside the operating room knew who got the actual surgery or who got the sham surgery. Six months later, Anyone who wanted to take a guess, you can see where I'm going with this. There was no measurable difference between the two groups. Well, people didn't want to believe it, especially many of our colleagues on the orthopedic side. So it was repeated, the same results. It was repeated again, the same results. So in addition to our three tools that we already have in the toolbox, I want to add one more. And this goes back, way back to our favorite philosopher, David Hume. And he said, experience only teaches us how one event constantly follows another without instructing us on the secret connection which binds them together and renders them inseparable. So we know that is the confusing causation and correlation. And that's what really the placebo is, effect is. When we attribute something to something that correlates with an improvement does not mean it necessarily causes the improvement. So those are the four, four tools that I had in my toolkit after doing all this reading and going to amazing meetings and conferences. Now, science is, well, let's, let's ask Stephen Novello. What, what is science? Science is where we get our information from. What do you think science is? There's nothing magical about science. It is simply a systematic way for carefully and thoroughly observing nature and using consistent logic to evaluate results. Which part of that exactly do you disagree with? Do you disagree with being thorough, using careful observation, being systematic, or using consistent logic? That's good questions. So science gives us, as I mentioned, this hierarchy of evidence. The strength of the evidence goes up as you go up the pyramid. 
But why do we need that? We need that because we are human. We need to control the biases. We need to meet the burden of proof that it takes to call something knowledge. We need to minimize our assumptions, as we discussed. We need to minimize placebo effects. So that's what weird things are. But why do people believe weird things? That's what, the, the, that's what I was interested in next. What's the psychology behind it? Shortly after uh, Andrew Wakefield's study was published and it got out into the, into the public, uh, just perception that vaccines cause autism. And parents started refusing the vaccine for kids, especially after they saw this. Here's Jenny McCarthy again on Oprah. Right before his MMR shot, I said to the doctor, I have a very bad feeling about this shot. This is the autism shot, isn't it? And he said, no, that is ridiculous. It was a mother's desperate attempt to blame something on autism. And he swore it. And not soon thereafter, I noticed that the picture, a change in the picture. Boom. Soul gone from his eyes. This was on daytime TV and one of the most popular talk shows ever. So how can you compete with that? Why do people believe weird things? And it's not really because of, we like to think of ourselves as so rational and processing information. Well, our brain does process information, but it processes it even before we know it. This is the brain. And this is where we have all of our conscious knowledge, right? our conscious experience rather, up here in this lower part. Information comes into us and is processed in the middle part. This little cherry right here is called the amygdala. It assigns an emotion to the information that comes into us before we're even aware of it. That strikes an emotional uh, reaction. It causes two things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, cognitive dissonance and motivated reason. This, this is uh, Leon Fessinger is the person who described cognitive dissonance. He says, a man with conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts or figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. So it depends how deeply and how con our convictions are. How much of this is our sense of self? Beliefs that are part of one's sense of self have privileged status. An attack on such beliefs is an attack on yourself itself, and you will defend it. You have an emotional reaction to such attacks, and you act to preserve those beliefs through something called motivated reasoning. You cannot see the wrongness of our deeply held beliefs. That's what biases are, and that's what we have, and skeptics are no different. Skeptics have biases too. Critical thinkers have biases too. We just have to learn to recognize them. If you have rose-colored glasses and wear them all your life, you may not know you have rose-colored glasses on. Okay, here's one of my favorites, my side bias. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. What do you think, is he safe? Is he in or is he out? I know he's in, I'm from Pittsburgh. I don't just think he's in, I know he's in. And so did these guys. The, the, the Seattle coach thought different. He knew he was out. It's very easy to create my side bias. Now, it, we don't get to these very radical beliefs, uh, anti-science beliefs, very quickly. We start off slowly. Uh, the lady up in the left-hand corner is Carol Tavers. I had the pleasure of meeting her, and she worked with Elliot Aronson, and uh, who worked with Leon Festinger about uh, on the, in the field of cognitive dissonance. Now, picture those two people at, up at the top. They're very similar people in their worldview. They don't have much difference between them. It doesn't take much to set them on different paths. Can I vaccinate my child? Well, maybe one of them watched Oprah, maybe the other one didn't. Yeah, I'll vaccinate my kids. The doctor said they're safe. 
I'm not sure. Some say vaccines have risks. Well, right now they've got a little bit of distance between their worldviews. That distance represents the cognitive dissonance, which is the emotional pain you have to go through to change your views. Not that much difference between them right now. It's, it's doable. You could probably change the mind. But unless someone does, they wander down the path. Vaccines save lives. Science rocks. Vaccines kill. Homeopathy is the best. When you sign on to a particular side, my side bias kicks in, and you identify with that as per your sense of self. You also ident start identifying with all of the baggage that comes with that belief. And those who tend to believe things like the cognitive dissonance between the two sides becomes immense. It's very, very low uh, probability that you're going to get one of them to cross the big mountain. Now, once you take a position that's not supported by science and evidence, and you want to defend it, you have to defend it with fallacies. It's not supported by logic, so you defend it with logical fallacies. Now, on my website, I go through a ton of logical fallacies, but there's lots of good sources there. Uh, and there are two groups of them. There's formal fallacies, which are kind of just logic puzzles. And then there's informal fallacies, which if you're in an argument with somebody, you'll probably hear a whole bunch of informal fallacies. Uh, some of our favorites, the straw man, appeal to final consequences, appeal to authority. Jenny McCarthy, is she, an, is she a relevant authority on vaccines? No, but people remember that Oprah episode. So uh, we, we've learned a little bit about why people believe weird things. And just to summarize what we've talked about so far, uh, beliefs are part of the sense of self. We develop biases. We uh, cannot get back out from underneath our own biases because of cognitive dissonance. And we defend our beliefs with fallacies. You guys know this guy? Yeah, we, we had the pleasure of seeing him in Detroit a couple years ago. Anyway, he has a riddle for us. What are you going to call an alternative medicine that's been proved to work? <laughs> yes? Okay. Medicine. So we're going to talk about alternative medicine. Uh, at, at any rate, we can divide uh, medicine into three basic groups, science, bad science, and frank pseudoscience. Science is well-established in medicine. It, it has the evidence to support it, and uh, the burden of proof is, is clearly been met. Bad science, well, there, there's some kernel of truth to maybe what, what is being claimed there, but not so much. In pseudoscience, is completely without evidence for, let's say, uh, prior probability. And of course, the direction of prior plausibility goes that way towards science, and the burden of proof goes that way towards the pseudoscience. So I want to add one more tool before we get talking about an alternative medicine. Uh, I want to introduce you to Harriet Hall. She's one of the, she's also called the Skepta. She's in science-based medicine, along with uh, Steve Novella and others. Uh, you can measure how much money the tooth fairy leaves under the pillow, whether she leaves more cash for the first or last tooth, whether the payoff is greater if you leave the tooth in a plastic bag versus wrapped Kleenex. You can get all kinds of good data that is reproducible and statistically significant. Yes, you have learned something, but you haven't learned what you think you've learned because you haven't bothered to establish whether the tooth fairy really exists in the first place. She turned this tooth fairy science. Before you study a phenomenon, you better be darn sure the phenomenon exists. So tooth fairy science is something I want y'all to kind of keep in mind with all the other tools there. The first one I want to talk about is Reiki therapy. I want to go, Reiki, it's, it's kind of nice. It, it's a service offered, I was called a service offered by many healthcare institutions. It, it was, um, Come, it, the term came about in 1922. It's actually an ancient term that is applied to the way it's used today. It's attributed to a Japanese fellow named, I'm going to say, Mikao Usha. I may have mispronounced that. I apologize. Now, what this was was, that was the rest. This is a system of uh, uh, energy healing. The claim is, first of all, Ray has to do with um, your the life energy, 
and ki is the vital force. Life energy is surrounding us when we get the universe. And the vital force is within us. And if you can balance those two, you should be able to treat patients and cure disease. And you balance those two by a, a licensed Reiki therapist who puts their hands either on or just over the patient and balances these forces, these energy forces. Now, we could study the effects of that. We could study the effects all day. Like we could study the effects of what, how, how much money is left under the pillow in rich neighborhoods versus poor neighborhoods when a tooth is left under the pillow. But we haven't learned what we think we know, what we think we know. Until Emily Rosa came along. When she was nine, this is a, a, a science project in the fourth grade that she entered. She came up with an idea. Let's take Reiki practitioners and let's see if they can feel her life energy. She put them behind a screen, and they're, 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 they're the hands of the Reiki practitioners behind the screen, and she held her hand over their hands and she flipped a coin, right or left, heads or tails. Beforehand, she asked the practitioners, can you feel my life force? And she held her hand out, and they all said yes, definitely. And so they put them behind the screen and they did the test. They ran it a whole bunch of times. Now, you would expect, if nothing was going on, about, about 50%. They would get left or right, if, if they were just guessing. If there is a kernel of truth to it, they should be able to get it much more than that. They all thought they could do it 100% of the time. In fact, they got it right 44% of the time. Yeah. A little bit less than what chance would predict, but still within, within that. She wrote this up as her fourth grade science project, and she did not win it. <laughs> it was, however, published in the journal of the Tooth Fairy Science. The effect wasn't there. The effect wasn't there. All the research that was being done on it, the effect wasn't there. Now that didn't stop uh, some institutions from proclaiming the effect was there and trying to explain it using modern science. Here's a website uh, that, that talks about Reiki. It talks about where it is. It talks about Ray is the external energy and P is the internal life force. And, and it says, uh, recent findings in the area of quantum physics have provided the scientific foundation for Reiki and other integrative modalities. Then they went on to claim the benefits of Reiki provide relief from pain, strengthens the immune system, helps clear toxins from the body, raising your hands, redirecting the energy. Now, you may think that this was from some crank site. Uh, you, Mark, you, you may recognize the source where this came from. <laughs> this is my institution. This is Beaumont Hospital. Uh, it started off in, in Royal Oak in the Detroit metro area. And they have a department of integrative medicine. So they try and integrate traditional medicine with, they don't call it alternative medicine, they call it something else. But it's entirely different. And it's very, very popular. And it's so popular, uh, they had to develop this integrative medicine department because they had to compete. Here's Henry Ford's integrative medicine department, right from their own website. But, oh, uh, here's the Cleveland Clinic. I had to get in on it too. Oh, wait, here's Harvard. Harvard has an integrative medicine department as well. Now, <laughs> Harriet Hall was, uh, she came up with the gem, Tooth Fairy Science. But this one is my favorite. This, uh, this is Mark Crislip. He's also uh, one of the doctors and founding members of Science Based Medicine. If you mix cow pie with apple pie, it does not make the cow pie taste better. <laughs> it makes the apple pie worse. <laughs> he was talking about integrative medicine departments. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. Integrative medicine departments, they almost all universally uh, offer acupuncture. Acupuncture is a very difficult topic to study. Uh, it, the idea is that we have an internal energy, here's a uh, key again, that circulates through our body, through meridians, which don't really exist. They don't correlate with the nervous system as we know it. But it kind of came from beliefs from a long time ago. Uh, in these meridians, there's various systems with all the different meridians. The idea is that if you put needles just under the skin, you block the flow of chi just right in those meridians to balance out 
whatever, your, your life energy. Make you feel better if you're in the sea this year. However, again, if you go down the rabbit hole of studying something, you really gotta study it well. Once you decide, okay, we're gonna study this phenomenon, uh, never mind whether it exists or not, whether, never mind whether meridians exist or not. And many studies have been done. The problem is how do you double blind an acupuncture trip? How do you get people to not know if they're in the placebo group or the control group? They're being poked with needles. There's some very clever studies. This one used two things. The, the patient is on their back, they can't see what's going on, and the um, practitioner was very, very silent. He, he really tried not to give it away, and he just tapped the skin with toothpicks. And it was a very well done trial for what, it, for what it's worth. The authors said it was inconclusive because it was negative. It remains unclear whether acupuncture or simulated method of acupuncture provides physiologic important stimulation or represent placebo or non-specific effects. They were kind of going down the, the path of saying it works so well you don't even have to do it. <laughs> Many studies followed. They developed placebo needles that even the practitioner didn't know if the needle was puncturing the skin. They retracted into the handle just like those knives that you know used on stage, they retract into their handle. They develop these little stands so that when you put the placebo needle into the stand, it hits resistance and you really can't tell if it's going into the skin or going up into the handle. So they do have methods of double blinding. The patient doesn't know, the practitioner doesn't know, of studying acupuncture and its effects. None of the studies that use proper controls were possible. None of them. However, just recently, it is a very popular notion. I see Ed shaking his head here. <laughs> this was uh, published in JAMA just, 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 last, just the other day, actually. And the claim is that acupuncture may diminish the symptoms of angina. Sorry, Mark, angina. <laughs> tomato tomato. Angina is the chest pain that people with heart uh, disease feel, especially when they exert themselves. Now, there's, this was touted in the news. This was on the evening news, this was in all the journals, and it was in all the blogs. Acupuncture must work. It must, there must be something to it. No one bothered to read the study on the news. If they did, they, they must have skipped over a few points. Let's, let's, get, let's go through a few points here. First off, it was not double blind. The practitioners knew what they were doing, and that's a problem. If I'm giving you a treatment and I know whether it's the placebo effect, or the placebo treatment, I should say, or not, you may pick up on many cues from me. I may want the trial to be positive. I may kind of, in body language, discourage you from thinking you're in the treatment. They weren't using acupuncture. They were using electroacupuncture. They put needles under the skin and they applied electric current to it. That's not acupuncture. That's electroacupuncture. We actually have a treatment that is kind of like that. It's called a TENS unit. I don't know if anyone has ever used a TENS unit. You apply the electric current and it does reduce pain. So the study was not double blind. They weren't studying what they claimed to be studying. There is no difference actually between the sham group and the control group. Now there always should be a difference in people who get nothing or on the wait list and people who get something, even if it's that something is nothing. There should be a difference. And that should raise a red flag. The meridians, by the way, don't exist. We we're studying tooth fairy science. They compared true meridians versus fake meridians. No one ever bothered to establish that true meridians exist. So let's weigh the probability of the claim. Its prior probability is pretty low. Meridians don't exist. The strength of the new evidence, not very good, especially when you read the studies. And all the prior studies. So I have to give that one a no. I have no doubt that people who undergo acupuncture, many of them come out with a positive experience. But remember, if you give someone anything, especially attention, they will have a, an experience, and most of the time that experience may be positive. 
I just want to talk real quickly while we're talking about alternative medicine. Many people uh, may not have heard too much about this, but this has become very um, uh, popular and very concerning. Stem cells. That's been the talk of the town for, for a decade at least. <coughs> and it's the science of the future. We're going to cure everything with stem cells. Well, there are, there's a lot of good research going on. Currently, the only thing that we use stem cells for, the only thing that has passed the muster, is bone marrow transplants. That's the only thing that has been approved for uh, stem cell treatment. That's the only thing we actually know the stem cells work for. There are other things coming that are being studied closely, but we haven't gotten there. Now, it became very popular back a few years. You, know, you, you, you guys know him? Of course, Cordy Howe. Mr. Hockey, you're from Detroit. You know Cordy Howe. He did from Traverse City. Now, Gordy Howe had a stroke a couple years ago, and his uh, family took him down to Tijuana and to a stem cell clinic in Tijuana who was claimed to be buying stem cells from a company in California. Whether they were actual stem cells or not, it's not clear. And we've never established that stem cell therapy is a treatment for stroke, or why should it be? Anyway, he had stem cells from somewhere injected into his spine. And some of his family members said, yeah, he got a little bit better. Some of his family members said, yeah, no, not so much. He came back to the United States and then went back down, I believe, one more time. And he finally passed away two years later. This got in the news. I mean, this was Mr. Hockey. And I had patients coming in. I hadn't even heard of this yet. And they were coming in wanting the stem cell therapy that Gordy Howe got. And it became so popular, stem cell uh, clinics. We were no longer doing stem cell tourism, going to countries with black schools, but they were starting to pop up in the United States too. Here's one in Metro Detroit. It's called Motor City Stem Cell. It's run by a classmate of mine. And he's making outrageous claims, none of which are supported by science, and it's not cheap. These are some of the claims he's talking about what he does here. He sells stem cell cream, it's $300. <laughs> he combines that with ozone treatment. What he does is he puts the stem cell cream on your skin and then it injects ozone underneath. What is that supposed to be? Do I have no idea. When you're making stuff up, anything's anything's good. Now, actual stem cell treatments on their website says $1,200 and up, but seminars are put on just like this to promote stem cell treatments and it's more than 1200 bucks. It's usually $10,000 or more. People are going into <laughs> debt. People are, are spending their life savings on treatment that at this point we can call 237 cents. But it's not, not just motor city stem cell. Here's a sports and regenerative medicine in Traverse City. And they make all kinds of claims. These, I, you can't even see it. These are all the claims that are being made about their treatment. They cure everything. There's nothing that's not cured by stem cells. Uh, not, it's not just bone and joint things. They're, they're talking about curing uh, feeling fatigue. And some sites claim that they cure your children's autism with stem cells. Anyway, let's apply the rules of personal Bayesian thinking, burden of proof, correlation causation. Nope, we're not going to let that one pass. Okay, but let's move on. The one ring to rule them all. The one alternative medicine that beats them all. The granddaddy. We're talking about homeopathy. Homeopathy was a practice that was invented by this guy, Samuel Hahnemann, and way back a long time ago, back around 1800. And he came up with an idea. He was observing some things. He, he came up with the idea that things that make you sick will cure your illness. That which makes you sick also cures you, if it doesn't kill you, first of all. And how did he come up with that idea? Well, he was really interested in malaria. Malaria is still to this day is a huge killer around the world. And it's, it's caused by an organism, an intracellular parasite called plasmodium. And it is treated with a drug called quinine. quinine. Anyway, the symptoms of malaria are these. Uh, shivering, sweating, headache, vision loss, abdominal pain, 
vomit, dark urine, hemolytic anemia. Now, he was an observant guy, and he was pretty clever now. He noticed that people who eat the cinchona bark will develop something called cinchonism. It just so happens, he didn't know this, that the cinchona bark is the source of quinine. That's where the medicine comes from. But if you eat this bark, you develop symptoms from eating the bark itself. Shivering, sweating, headache, blurry vision, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark urine, hemolytic anemia. They look familiar, don't they? So he reasoned, maybe at the time, it may have been reasonable to think this, like must cure like. That which creates the symptoms must cure it because people were actually getting better from their malaria because it accidentally had the cure in it. It was the broken clock rule. You know, a broken clock is right twice a day. He hit it right on the nose. So like cures like, but if you give something that causes the symptoms, it, well, it actually makes things worse. So you gotta do something else. First, you have to define what's called the law of infinitesimals. Now, the law of infinitesimals is where you take a something, you dissolve it in a mother tincture, you get a solution of stuff. And it's really, you know, it's, it's concentrated. And then you start diluting. Let's say you have 100 milliliters of something, of a solution. Then you take one drop out of it, one milliliter, and put it into another 100 milliliter container. You shake it up, you do this ritual. Hahnemann described a ritual called succussion, where you have to shake it four times in each direction. This way, this way, this way, this way. And it works better if you hit it with a leather strap. Actually, he described the leather uh, cover of a Bible. Not so much. Then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. You do it again and again and again and again and again until you come with a solution that is so dilute. Come on, Johnny Carson. It's so dilute, there's nothing in it. There's actually nothing left in it. So let's make a cure for diabetes. Let's do an experiment. This is a can of Coke, and it has roughly 3.7 times 10 to the 18th molecules of sugar in a can of Coke per 100 cc's of a can of Coke. Now, we all know that diabetes and sugar go together. So if we dilute this until it's practically not there, we should have a cure for diabetes. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do a 9C dilution. A C, the C means 100. That means you take one drop, one, one milliliter out, and you put it into 100 milliliters. So it's a 100 uh, dilution. There's also the uh, connotation of X. You can have a you know, 10X dilution. That's where you do it in 10 cc's. So it's a 1 in 10 dilution. Anyway, you do it nine times, and it's all gone. There's no sugar left in that solution if you just do it nine times. Is that our cure for diabetes? Does that have, does that pass the muster? Let's, let's think about, uh, you know, free test probability. Probably not, it's pretty low. Well, this, uh, we, we come to an understanding of this. Uh, there's, we, we, we now know how much stuff is in stuff. And it was discovered, well not discovered, but it was, this number was described or attributed to a man named Avogadro. He actually didn't call it Avogadro's name. Anyway, he discovered that uh, there's 10, 6 times 10 to the 23rd things in what he called a mole of things. It's like there's 12 eggs in a dozen of eggs. Well, there's this big number in a mole of things. So if you have a solution like our can of Coke, the one molar solution would have 6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of sugar per liter. So that, that we know pretty much how much stuff is in stuff. Now, if I start diluting it by 100, and I do that again, and again, and again, and again, how many times do we have to go until we get to zero? 12. All we have to do is a 12C solution, and there's nothing in it. Now, if you buy homeopathy off the shelf or go to a homeopath, you might buy something that's 200C. They did it this many times, and then they did it almost 200 times more. Or maybe even more, 500 C. Sky's the limit. And then you sell it. This I took, uh, this is a picture from Target. I took uh, a few months ago. 
This is a product called oscillococcinum, and they sell it in the winter time as a potential cure for flu or a treatment for flu. Now, I want to call attention. This is a 30 dose family value pack. There's 30 tablets in there, and it costs 30 bucks. It's a bucket pill. Good deal? I don't know. But what is oscillococcinum? It, it was, um, I forget the gentleman's name because I don't have my notes on the article. But back, he was trying to come up with a cure for Spanish flu in the early 20th century. And he started looking, for whatever reason, at duck livers and duck hearts under the microscope. And he saw these oscillating cocci, he called them vibrating balls, he called them oscillating cocci. In the microscope, and in every sample he looked at, he found these things. And he said, aha, I don't know why he said that, but he said, aha, <laughs> this must be the thing that causes flu. It was likely an artifact in his microscopy because nobody has ever seen vibrating balls in, in the solution that wasn't an artifact on the microscope, a mistake. Anyway, he made a mother tincture from duck liver and heart liver. I'm sorry, duck liver and duck heart. And he made 200C dilution. And he claimed he had a cure for flu. And now they, they do that supposedly. I don't know if they actually go through all those dilutions or not to sell it to the public. And then they, they take that solution and they put them on sugar pills. And they put them in boxes and they charge $30 to you guys in the pharmacies. Every winter, it's there. So what, what's the actual evidence for homeopathy? Never mind the prior probability, what's the strength of the new evidence? Well, the, uh, there's the largest ever systematic review of homeopathy published by Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council. They, they looked at 57 review, systematic reviews. These are reviews of studies. At any rate, I, I don't want to go through all of this, but they said based on our assessment of the evidence, the effectiveness of homeopathy, they concluded that there is no health condition for which there is a reliable evidence that homeopathy is effective. Homeopathy should not be used to treat health conditions that are chronic, serious, or could become serious. Now, homeopathy was very, very popular, probably more so in Europe than it is here. England, for years, had homeopathic hospitals, entire hospitals devoted to homeopathy. One by one, they've all been closed, just recently. I believe some other European countries, I believe France, is basically taking homeopathy off of their national health system. People, they also said people who choose homeopathy may put their health at risk if they reject or delay treatments for which there is good evidence for safety and effectiveness. So we started our journey with this book. Why do people believe weird things? We found out a few reasons why people believe them. We found out some ways to guard against believing some tools, if you will, of skepticism. But maybe I'm wrong. Now, I want to show you just a real quick video to end. Uh, it, this is a, as I said, we don't learn much critical thinking skills in medical school. A lot of people are surprised by that. We are, we are fed world information, and we trust that it's true. We are not immune to believing weird things. Here's a doctor, an ophthalmologist, who has a practice in Texas. This is publicly available. This is off of her website. Followed by another short video of a popular web internet uh, homeopath. Followed by some words of wisdom by a skeptical dentist turned comedian. Could you just go back one slide? I want to take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. 